book book review book book review book book review book book <laughs> we're back baby we're back at last i read book now i tell you first off we have i'm a cat by Sos soseki natsume it's a japanese writer who spent some time in england and then he came back and then he published this in a magazine only i think the first chapter he wasn't planning to make it into this beast that it is today but people like this so much that he kept publishing it and uh, yeah maybe that's how you're supposed to read it just like in parts here and there it is the story told from a cat that's what i knew about it going in and it's supposed to reflect on the meiji period in japan which is transitional period between the westernization of japan at least that's what i thought so i made one of these to make it uh, simple so I hit, this is what i read what i expected some weird meiji period stuff you know some commentary about it uh some cat stuff some sexy cats maybe i, I don't know the cat's name is chibi so i expected like a cute little chibi cat uh here's what i got <laughs> I wonder if anyone's read this book is actually going like, yeah, that, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> so we have uh, some boomer uh, hating on his wife. This pretty much summarizes it right here. The cat kind of <laughs> just glancing. Uh, we got some jam. We got a fat cat. We got angry uh, Japanese men and something about a glass ball. I, I don't really get it. <coughs> Guys, check out new G Fuel while we're at it. So. This book is a satire, it's a very old satire, but that doesn't stop it from being enjoyable, just like Don Quixote or any other book that is well written, you know? The fact that this is Soseki's uh, first novel is incredible, because it's, you know, it's up there. After reading this, it feels like a hidden classic, uh, like a hidden gem. Uh, that's what I thought, at least, because I've never heard about it before, and I've done that mistake in the past where, just because I haven't heard of a book before, <laughs> That doesn't mean no one else has. <laughs> I'm like, no one's talking about this book with a Nobel Prize Award writer. But uh, no, that's not the case. But I, I did look into it and uh, it clearly left an impact on uh, in Japanese culture. So the Japanese title is Wagahai Neko. So I am a cat. Wagahai being a pronoun that I, I thought is, is so unusual that it doesn't normally exist. So bowser uses it for example here referring to himself in high regard same with the the cat in persona 4 so Siki also is depicted in the anime boys something i don't remember and he's also in phoenix Wright ace attorney look at it uncanny so he clearly left an impact on on japanese culture uh what's the book about then well uh, it's about a bunch of characters mainly just speaking to each other that's pretty much it there's no real story and it's chibi the cat who just observes these characters communicating uh the main character is chibi's owner which is mr sneeze uh there's his wife mrs sneeze there's bochamp the poet or the artist there's cold moon the scientist and then there is waver house the asshole the prick and there's a couple others too but i love the names of the characters by the way they're so good the story is something about a burglary and they steal their jam mr sneeze complains about his wife constantly <laughs> he goes to report the crime and then a bunch of kids start being annoying and then it ends really bleakly and sadly Story, the story is not the most interesting thing here. Where this book shines is really when the characters are communicating and talking about different subjects or sharing different ideas and anecdotes. Uh, it's highly allegorical and it feels like you're almost like a stage play where everyone is interacting in the same space in this room talking to each other and it's being observed by the cat. And to me, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy reading so much because you can immerse yourself in discussion and topics and ideas that transpires time and uh, culture and place. You feel like you are there contemplating the same thoughts that the characters are and being part of the discussion almost and it's just uh, I don't think there's any other medium that can properly do that I feel like this book style of writing reminds me of Dostoevsky a lot I remember there's a part in Dostoevsky's The Idiot where they are talking about public execution and uh, I remember uh, reading that and just feeling so part of it and contemplating this weird concept that we used to have in a way I never would have uh, thought about before and I mean obviously it's not like 
it's just random things, but I think that's what makes reading fun to me. I don't necessarily care that much what happens to characters and, and different things like that. I think it's more fun to share ideas and th this book is packed with that. And especially with the, the idea of the execution, this book talks about the mechanics of hanging very similarly for, <laughs> for a great length. And, you know, it's not like I went in wanting to read about that, but it was very interesting and fun to follow nevertheless. The book is also obviously commenting about a lot of Western literature and culture, which I find very fun to hear a Japanese perspective on. Uh, there was a story that I've even brought up on my own and uh, on this channel, which is the story of the ancient Greek story of the writer that uh, tried to escape his uh, prophecy that he was going to die inside a house. I don't know if you guys remember or watched the video, but it's so funny. I think they said in the book that he was a writer, though, and that he went out to write to avoid dying. But then there was an eagle flying by who wanted to drop a turtle that he was holding onto a rock to smash open his shell. Well, he thought he saw the writer's uh, thick head, uh, because according to this book, writers are just so thick-headed. Uh, <laughs> he, he dropped the turtle on the head, and that's how the writer died. A lot of random stuff like that being shared in this book, which I, I don't know, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was fun. I think a lot of people probably, at least what I expected too, is, you know, being more focused on the cat. Uh, there are some bits here and there where the cat describes typical cat-like behavior, like how why they watch themselves a certain way or what they do for exercise or why they meow and other cat-like behavior, but it's explained in a sense that if there was a human explaining it with perfect logic, even though there's these uh, things that make no sense why cats do, and I'm <laughs> probably at least, uh, from a human perspective at least, you still get to follow it. And those bits are great, I, I really enjoyed those. And I think that's another reason why I enjoy entering the mindset of, uh, of this cat. It's very fun. This kind of crazy introspection where what they're saying doesn't really make sense, but you're still in their mind following it, so it's still fun anyway. So yeah, you just follow the characters along in this book with different small events happening here and there. There's not much to talk about. I think, uh, you know, I gave some examples of it. It finishes very bleakly and darkly about predicting the future of Japan and, and their culture with this this shift that they're going through, uh, that there will be no marriage in the future, which there's certainly less of, and that the rise of individualism is the cause of this, which is definitely a case, considering this was written 100 years ago. But I, then again, I don't know, you know, maybe the signs were already there back then. And that everyone in the future will commit suicide, which I'm thankful hasn't happened at least, but you know, it's definitely a problem. I would rate this book 4 out of 5. Very good. I would be cautious to recommend this book though. I think there's a lot of other books I think that you can read before it. But if you haven't heard of it, then uh, yeah, maybe it's something to check out. Next book we have, quite random actually, it's uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel, which is a billionaire investor in PayPal or creator, founder, uh, early investor in Facebook. That's what I knew at least. And I know he's the guy that sued Gawker into non-existence. He's a controversial figure, but I think most billionaires are, to be fair. My point is I don't really know much about him besides that. This book was recommended to me by a friend, and I have no interest in what it's about, but I thought it's fun to read different stuff sometimes. I Sometimes when I get into reading, I don't really care what I'm reading. It's like, yeah, sure, I'll check that out, sure, well, whatever. This is the book on start startups. It says notes on startups, but it, as far as I understand, this is like the Bible of startups, according to people. And I guess that's a topic that I'm not necessarily that interested in. Most things I hear about startups sounds kind of cringeworthy and horrible. Uh, that whole culture of Silicon Valley just seems uh, something I don't, I don't like. And even though I, you know, I didn't really find myself like, oh, I hate it while reading it, when I was writing down my thoughts on the book, I, they all tended to be quite negative, which I, and I don't, I'm not entirely sure why, and I, but I think it's just the overall culture around these type of things that probably makes me look at it in, in an unfair light. I'm not saying this is a bad book by any means, but just uh, I feel like I skipped a couple of steps. Maybe I should explain what the book is, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's the thing, the book isn't very structured. It's just random ideas kind of here and there sprinkled out. It almost feels like Peter ha is holding back with a lot of things. I think he's a little crazy, but he doesn't want to let people know how crazy he is. I, th I definitely felt like he was holding back reading this. But the main gist of this book, and if I had to summarize it with one thing, is that... Okay, what I read, 0 to 1. 
what I expected. A bunch of money stuff. And <laughs> I have no idea what I expected, to be honest. I just put random shit. What I got was uh, something about the Unabomber, AI, Monopolies, and, and Founders being important. Kind of random, right? That's I guess that's what I meant when there's a lot of just random thoughts that I think he's interested in being shared. But the main gist of this book is the idea that if you want to go from zero to one, if you want to start up that really makes it a, a, the banger, you want to come up with something that isn't just replicating what other businesses are doing, but something that's unique in a sense that it highly stands out. Uh, he starts off by making a case for monopolies, which I thought was interesting at least. I don't know if I agree with it, but it's fun to hear different thoughts. You know, most people were all taught growing up that monopolies are bad and uh, it's better for competition if there's many businesses. According to Peter, what this just does is that it squeezes uh, companies dry for making a profit and that prohibits them from doing bigger ideas and bigger things, you know. Businesses like restaurants and businesses like uh, airlines have famously really low profit margins because they're so competitive. Um, so even though they're massive businesses, there's not much else you can do for that. I guess there's a case there, you know, we're still flying the same airplanes from like from the 70s, right? Hasn't been any innovation and change? Maybe that's a symptom of it. I Just a random thought in my head, but then again, they buy the planes from other companies, so... I'm not sure. I don't know, but that's an example of, of it. I, he brings up Google as a secret monopoly. If you ask Google, hey, are you a monopoly? You can't be a monopoly. Google just go like, hey... Yahoo? You wanna go... <laughs> Yeah, who exists? Okay, I'm not a monopoly, but there's there's like Alta Vista right there. You guys can check it out. So it, it is Google has monopoly. It just uh, doesn't want anyone to know about it. And that makes it possible for Google to do a bunch of different things. And whether that's good or bad, I think is not very clear, at least. And the way to become a monopoly uh, like Google is to have a product that is just so good that you are not going to want to go anywhere else. Which is pretty much the case, you know? We use Google because there's, they are by far the best option because they invested an ungodly amount of becoming that product. I think probably the more interesting thing in the book, if there's one thing I had to take from it, is the idea that if you want to create a business that goes from zero to one, like a business that makes it, you have to answer Peter Thiel's question that he asked if you want to hire someone, which is, what is one view you hold on an important matter shared by few other people? I'm not sure entirely if that was the quote. What is something that you know that other people don't? I guess you could phrase it. And if you can answer that, then you have the foundation of a business that could really make it big. Obviously, airlines, restaurants, wherever there is, they will always be profitable businesses and very successful in these areas. But the businesses that really take off and you make a ton of money on, if that's your goal, they are the ones that don't just improve, but rather change the world. Kind of like Facebook did, which Peter was an early investor in. Same with PayPal, really. PayPal's goal, I think, was to become an online currency. That was their original goal, which I mean, Bitcoin came along and did the job properly, I think. I think it's a good example of something that a lot of people knew, but not most people, I think. But a lot of people knew there would be a digital currency in the future. Obviously, PayPal becomes something else, but I think it's a good example of that share of answering that question of what is something that you know that a lot of people don't. And that's how you create a successful startup, which I think, yeah, I probably I agree with that. <laughs> that's a good advice. It's not bad, but I will have to rate it two out of five because just because I think he's holding back. And I think he is... It felt a bit random, to be honest. I would like to hear more from Peter. I, I wouldn't mind hearing if he makes something else. Next book. This is the book that truly matters. This is the book that changed my life, okay? The Useful Knots book. How to tie the 25 plus most practical notes, knots. Hell yeah. This is what it's all about. Why did I buy this book and not just look up online? I... I thought it could be nice for once to not stare at a screen, okay? So I used to sail a lot when I was younger and I used to know all these knots. And then I realized I completely forgot them. I gotta know my knots. I gotta know my knots. Check this out. So in Sweden, the way they would teach us this knot, I don't know what it's called in English, uh, but we would have a lake, right? So if you go with a boat and you want to tie up your boat to a, a, a round object or something, you have a lake 
and I would say, here comes the dragon, and it goes, he goes under the lake, and then he grabs the bunny. This is supposed to be the bunny. I'm like, what do you mean bunny? That makes no sense. There's no bunny. And then he go back into the, what do you mean? <laughs> he didn't grab anything, but there you go. It's a beautiful knight. I will never forget you again. Very strong, very strong knight. I guess that's the thing with the book. It tells you the philosophy of knots. You know, any idiot can tie a knot. But the goal is to tie a knot that is fast, strong, and also easy to untie. That's the goal of knot. I mean, this is the easiest knot, but it's so good. A lot of times with boats, you want to tie around a, a cylindrical object. Beautiful knot. Beautiful knot. It's strong this way. It's strong this way. Very good knot. Love this knot. I don't know what they're called in English. Roban! I remember in Sweden. I'll never forget this night. You do the... You do the thing. <laughs> Alright. It's if you want to tie two uh, ropes together. They would always make us do this. This is like one of the most basic knots. So pretty too. Pretty knot. Actually, it will hold! Ah! Which is good if you want to extend your tump, as we call it in Sweden. Another thing at the end of your rope. If you're sailing, especially, you don't want your uh, you don't want the rope to fall through the winch or the uh, the uh, the thing. So you would always have to tie something at the end of it, and I would always do the eight. I love the eight. Look at that eight. That's a nice eight. That ro that rope ain't going nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Useful knots, guys. Check it out. Book review. Last book, guys. The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ichiguro. I've read another book from him in the past called Never Let Me Go, which was kind of interesting. It was a weird one. I also read The Sleeping Giant from him, which I hate. I don't ever want to think about that book. But I decided to give it another go because I saw the cover. Never judge book by cover, they say. Well, I do it, okay? I thought it looked nice. Minimalistic. I am an epic minimalist. So what I expected was that it's a story about a butler. And what I got was this. And I will explain this. That's the actual, uh, the original uh, cover for the book. The book is old as hell, okay? <laughs> I have no idea. It's not like it matters, but it's more like I thought it was a new book and it's, it turned out to be old book. I don't want to read an old book. The way I knew it was an old book was because uh, I googled the title eventually and this old movie showed up and I'm like, what? They made it? It's, it's made from a movie? <laughs> It's like, no, the the book came first. But Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. So yeah, the story follows a butler. His name is Mr. Stevens, and he reflects on his past when he was serving as a butler in the house called Kensington Hall, I think. Mr. Stevens' care is anime level of dedication to his work of being in a butler. It's all he cares about, and he aspires to be the greatest butler there is. And it's very fascinating to hear him talk about how seriously he takes this job as a butler and sort of how he this has been something passed down from his father who was also a butler. And it's seen as something very noble when people really dedicate their life to their craft. But the more you read, you start to realize that uh, him wanting to be a butler, the best butler there is, has come with a great price of, of a lot of things. Uh, for example, his relationship with his father, him sacrificing his morals with who he serves as a butler in the past, and maybe most importantly, he sacrifices his own happiness and, and possibility of finding true love. These are things and sacrifices that he's made, but seems completely oblivious to, but as a, as a reader, it's obvious. This book is so damn well written. Kazu is a Nobel Prize uh, awarded author and it's very clear reading this just because you feel like you are reading a, the words from a butler. There's never a doubt in my mind that that's the case. It's written in this most utmost British posh, eloquently spoken. I can't do it, but you, you know what I mean? Like this super posh. I feel like I should read this book in a suit. It's very captivating just just by, uh, by that. Um, but Going in finally on uh, what I meant with this picture is what I feel a lot of times, especially reading his other book, Never Let Me Go, uh, and other British authors too, like Virginia Woolf, I, I appreciate them, and I appreciate that they're great books, but I can't stand them. I, <laughs> I don't know why I even read them, because they are so dreary. My god, everything is so difficult. <laughs> when there's characters 
and emotions between them that can't get ex expressed properly. I appreciate mel melancholy, but this is just too much, man. Just say how you feel. Why can't you just... I understand these are complicated emotions and the fact that you're even able to depict them in the fiction is impressive, but I hate it. Stop it. It reads like... That's what I get out of it, okay? Stop it. Three out of five. I give it three out of five. That's all the books for this month. I wanted to continue for next month. I've already started reading Blood Meridian, but then... Uh, so I thought we'd do that for next month, because I can already tell it's amazing. But uh, Elden Ring came out, and I just dedicated my life to that. <laughs> but I'm excited to get back into it. This is an, what some people say is the greatest American novel. It's a Western anti-Western if that's interesting to you. But yeah, excited for more book review. Leave a like and smash like and uh, smash like for more and like smash like and I see you smash like. See you next time. Bye bye.